Well, hi, folks, and uh, welcome back to our Advent course we've been following through uh, these last uh, number of weeks through Advent. Um, you may remember we've been looking at uh, uh, Paula Gooder's book, uh, Journey to the Manger, uh, looking at um, the uh, Christmas stories, uh, the Exploring the Birth of Jesus is, is the subtitle to it. And uh, this week we've got up to uh, Aftermaths on part four. And um, we're actually doing this recording a day after we actually had the uh, Advent course meeting, but no matter, because I'm sure as we go through this uh, uh, discussion this afternoon, uh, that um, there'll be a lot that we can uh, unpick uh, from, from this chapter. So anyway, I, I have Jeremy here with me. And uh, hi, Jeremy. Hi, Andrew. Um, and uh, well, Jeremy, over to you. So, so what is this aftermath uh, part of the book all about? So the whole section has got a lot in it. And uh, like every week, there's much too much to, to cover. We're going to um, focus on uh, um, on the online session on the same area that we focused on um, face to face primarily. So the Magi or is it wise men or is it three kings? How many? <laughs> All of those questions. <laughs> we'll have a little um, reading of the Bible to cue that up. And then we'll just glance across at another later stage. Simeon and Anna, they're... Um, their response when the um, uh, the infant Jesus is brought along to be presented at the temple mm -hmm. and how that is uh, that response is still affecting us today. Mm -hmm. it's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So shall I read the um, the chapter from uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the passage from Matthew? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from Matthew, chapter two, verses one to eight. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. <laughs> yeah, Ends yeah. on an interesting yeah. note. It's Yeah, yes. And, and like all these Christmas stories, you know, we know them. Well, we think we know them well, don't we? You know, the, you know we're so familiar with them. And being so familiar to us, we, we tend to sort of lose the depth of detail. And I'm sure uh, there's a lot of detail in that story there that uh, we just gloss over. And well, tell us, Jeremy, what, what was things that, that interested you uh, from that uh, that particular passage there? And things so, like I said, wise men. That's yes. Like, yeah. so, so this word magi is really mm. interesting and slippery. Obviously, it isn't one we use um, in, uh, in regular daily use. No. Um, it's uh, uh, we effectively pick up that word pretty much as it was um, like transliterated, brought into English pretty much direct. Um, but we do have some derived words. So we might think of magic. Um, singular of uh, magi is magus. And it can mean all sorts of different things. And notice how Matthew told us how these were from the East, which is really, really vague. There's an awful lot of East. <laughs> and of course, lots of people will, will say, we don't know, we know how many gifts, but we don't know how many Magi. We don't know what kind of category they might have fallen under. So that term Magi could refer to, um, to particular people, particularly from, um, from places like Persia, and those people were actually the distinctions wouldn't necessarily have meant so much then as now. They might have been stargazers. They might have been um, uh, recorders of movements of stars, keepers of tables. They might have been astrologers. Astronomy and astrology were not highly distinguished in, in those times. Um, they could have been in that kind of category. They could have been distinguished people in their own right. Um, uh, but perhaps 
that's more likely to refer to um, to uh, to quite high status um, servants of a royal court. But that's not the extent of it. It could be people who are or claiming to be magicians. It could be um, it could absolutely be quacks and um, hustlers. <laughs> <laughs> con artists. Oh my goodness. <laughs> in the book of acts we get uh, we get one of those we get someone mm. referred to as bar jesus um, right. who's uh, um, who's a magus and that's very mm. definitely meant to mean con artists so actually when we pick to the kings we have to choose how to see them matthew doesn't <laughs> give us too many clues and there are a lot of choices a lot more choices than i'd really thought through previously um paula mm. is really good at opening her uh, opening our eyes to these possibilities yeah yeah i suppose we made them kings because of the gifts they that, that, that matthew says that they bring you know what well, does he say i can't remember now uh, we know it as gold <laughs> frankincense and myrrh and obviously they're expensive gifts so we sort of equate expensive gifts with um you know sort of expensive people as it were Hence yes gifts, but, yes yeah yeah so so but who, who are the gifts from so are these gifts uh, they're brought by these people but for example again are they gifts from a, a royal court to another royal court after all they say they've come to see the king who has been born and by the way how is herod responding to this oh, yeah. herod thinks he's the king and there isn't a vacancy yeah. so so the idea of a, of a king being born and these mm. gifts being brought now, if it's if it has that diplomatic feel to it, then those um, those rich gifts have one feel. But but one of them stands out certainly. Um, Ma, what's that doing there? And um, uh, th these it's a strange collection of gifts. And perhaps I if I think of where um, where my mind goes, it always goes to singing We Three Kings, which neatly packages three gifts. Um, three kings and they're named as kings and then the meanings of those are, are, are unpacked in familiar ways but actually there are so many choices so much that's not resolved but one thing that is really clear is Herod is not to be trusted <laughs> so it seems yeah. like these magi have enough wisdom to know that at the very least <laughs> yeah yeah and I guess Herod is an interesting character as well you just touched on a few moments ago there um as you say yes. he's uh, got a bit of a slippery background i think about him if i remember he, right he has so we're, we're used to him as a bit of a almost like a pantomime villain and that's <laughs> really not too far from the truth because if you want to be a king in jerusalem then mm. ideally you should be a king from the line of david um some of the christmas readings um at stress the way in which jesus is connected to david's line but if you're not from the line of David, well, there's another line you could be from, the Maccabeans. So between the periods of the Old and New Testament, there was the Maccabean uprising. And so there was another dynasty formed. Mm -hmm. And Herod isn't um, uh, isn't on the throne for any of those reasons. Herod um, was put on the throne, or rather Herod's father was put on the throne um, because he was a quiz. <laughs> when the Romans marched into Jerusalem, he was the person who seized the opportunity to go and welcome them and they installed him. So uh, so Herod the son is really someone with very little claim to the throne. He's not really from um, uh, from the tribes of, uh, um, of Israel at all. Um, at, at most, he's kind of connected in by marriage. So, yes, he's he's a he's someone holding on to power and expecting that he might be toppled or attacked or undermined at any time. So he's a he's a man of blood. No question about that. We see some of those um, uh, mentions and the, the laughing matter uh, and they're very plausible. They're, they're, they're absolutely the sort of thing that, that other historical records have given us about this bloody ruler. Mm, yeah so it's interesting how matthew focuses on these interesting characters a slippery character of herod uh, and also these wise men whoever they were and it's wondering if we've got any thoughts as to what matthew might be saying by introducing these characters into the christmas story here I, what, yes well, well one thing that um uh, I, I suppose a conversation I, I wouldn't say i've had lots of times um but i've had a, a conversation a few times <laughs> i think every every christmas i have at least, at least once or twice um where someone will say something along these lines um uh, i i love the um the sort of christmas story but it, I, I don't think it's got anything to do with me um mm. and part of what this really means for um for me is that matthew who if you read the whole of matthew's gospel you realize that he almost certainly has a has very definitely a jewish audience in mind he's always at pains to show how the 
um, uh, the story of Jesus is completely from within and into um, uh, the promises that Israel has, the relationship Israel has with God. And yet Matthew uses these far off distant and slightly dodgy, to be honest, because the Bible isn't always very kind about the thoughts of, um, uh, of people um, gazing into the stars for wisdom or trying to do magic or all of those things not approved at all and herod absolutely not a godly king not not a fit representative of um of the rule of uh, of the people of god so he, here is matthew showing an incident that i think lets any of us say no no we can slip into this story too yeah. if these figures could be in the christmas story absolutely i can yeah yeah i think it's a very valid point isn't it i think he, as you say he's showing that yeah primarily he's writing to the jewish uh, nation to jewish people he's also saying well actually christ was born for everybody including those who feel on the edge yeah. you know for whatever reason you know, I, it almost goes beyond that. That, 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 that one, one thing that I loved, and I didn't think think about so much until um, after our uh, our live face to face mm -hmm. session, is mm -hmm. the idea that that when the um, uh, uh, notice how Herod talks about show me exactly when this star um, happened. Well, there's a pretty good chance it's two or three years ago, maybe more, um, that this conjunction of stars happened. So actually, again, Matthew is helping us to see how plenty of people may not be insiders they may not be inside the christian faith <laughs> any more yes. than um than these major were inside um Jude. but god will speak to them in all sorts of ways in ways that were familiar to them and would seem very strange to us mm. actually god manages to reach out to us and that's the heart of the christmas story for me certainly is that reaching out from god to me it's not that we're trying to track god down god is really at work tracking us down mm. maybe that um uh, that connects us into the uh, into the simeon and anna um, yeah i was just going to say another way of reaching out to to us as well yes yeah, to, to older people Simon and Anna. Yes. Shall I shall I read um, another few verses yeah, just to please, introduce yeah. that? Mm -hmm. So this is from Luke. We've, um, we were in Matthew before. Now we're in Luke's Gospel, chapter two twenty five. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too gosh that's a um yeah. uh, th there's so much there some of those words of course so familiar that we um uh we talk about the nunc dimittis after yes. the, the, the the latin beginning of of what simon is saying there mm -hmm. that greeting i said said it, um uh, uh um that this is something which has resonances down to this day and always mm -hmm. will because that that moment at which promises are fulfilled mm -hmm. in the most jewish context of all surely that um right at the heart of the temple there is Jesus brought um, brought to God. There is Simeon who's had all of these um, these promises and is waiting for the promised Messiah, for the king sent from God. Mm. And in that moment, guided by the spirit, part of his focus is the Gentiles, is that mm. outward looking. So mm. this is a sign, if you like, happening right here in the middle of Israel. Mm. But it's like a beacon that's going to um, shed its light on the whole world 
and that's that's what we see today which is just amazing that's that's um why this advent and christmas overlap like one thing we didn't mention of course is this is an advent course and somehow we seem to have strayed well beyond advent but i think yeah. i think it's necessary i think part of the way that paul um, could have wrote this book helps us to um, to always keep those things integrated and, and of course we don't necessarily have really strong um dates or any of these things except possibly this one incident that there was a yeah. particular number of days um uh, that jesus would have been taken to the temple after being born so you can date that relatively but um uh, yes uh, not for example when was christmas day it, it, the day was chosen that was plausible but um the, the the biblical authors didn't think to record that for us no no well joe we're standing we're running out of time there's just so much in this chapter isn't there uh to unpack and unpick there and uh, uh but well i just encourage you folks you know um if you're able to if you haven't got the book i mean i do, do sort of recommend it you know um get it on amazon quite easily uh, of the four sections that are in there, um, it takes what, about a couple of hours, doesn't it, to read each part? Yes, uh, I would say. Sort of length. It's about 200 and so pages, oh no, 150-ish pages there. And some very good reflections he puts in there as well, uh, which really bring the Christmas story, you know, right up to, to date for us and, and to how it connects with us and what's going on with us in our life today in 2022 so i think the one thing i'd add to, add to that is is this is based on depth of scholarship but it's written oh, yeah. with a very light touch it's very very easy to follow and, and yes. uh, Paul Logan <laughs> helps to open our eyes um to what's there in the text and provide extra extra details to understand so a brilliant mm. book. it is absolutely yeah well there we are on that note uh, well thank you jeremy for sharing uh, some insights there on the aftermath and uh, uh, the wise men and uh, uh, Simeon and, and Herod yeah so um, thank you again and uh, once again folks uh, thank you for sharing with us and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon okay bye bye everybody bye bye bye